2018. Uh, we've been preaching on this for a few weeks now. We're getting pretty close to the end. Next week ought to sum up uh, the entire message. But uh, I want to say while you're turning there, man, I had a great time yesterday. We had, uh, we had our Kid Fest out here. and Really appreciate all of you that helped, all of you that took part in that. Uh, especially appreciate Cheryl. She did a great job putting that together. And uh, just really, really made the effort and made it, made it a great Kid Fest. So we had a great time and appreciate all of that. And so uh, always appreciate the kids, what they do. Enjoyed having them up here for a little while this morning. What a great day in the Lord. Um, 1 Samuel chapter 17. We call, we call this confronting the enemy. Because here's the situation, and for those of you who have been with us throughout all of this, You'll hear this introduction um, like you've heard it uh, the past five times. But in the introduction, here's what we find is Israel, the army of Israel, is facing off against the army of the Philistines. As they're preparing for battle, the Philistines have a champion among them. That champion's name was Goliath. Now, Goliath wasn't just your average man. He came from a family of giants. In fact, Goliath stood about nine feet plus tall, and was ready for battle. And when he came out for battle, it made all of the Israelite armies afraid. In fact, he came out and he challenged them. He said, if one of you guys will come out and fight me, we could save going into battle because you and I could fight, and whoever wins this, the others would just become servants. And the Philistines were willing to let him make that challenge, but the Israelites didn't have a man they felt like could come against Goliath. And so they were afraid. Even their king, King Saul, was afraid. And none of them would step out to battle their champion, Goliath. Well, in the midst of this battle, he would come out every day and make this same challenge. And so what happened was, in the midst of this, this challenge, David had some brothers that were a part of the army of Israel. And so David's dad said, hey, listen, your brothers are out there fighting. Um, let's prepare some food for them, take it out to them so that in the midst of this fight, they'll have something they could eat, take good care of themselves. So David did that. He went out to take the food to his brothers. While he was there taking the food to his brothers, uh, Goliath steps up, made the same challenges he had been making all along and uh, criticizing them because they wouldn't come out and fight and he was making fun of their God and who they were. And, and David's looking around going, isn't somebody going to fight this guy? And his brothers accused him of being mischievous, trying to stir up trouble. And David said, oh, no, I'll go out and fight him. Somebody needs to fight him. I can be that guy. And so David's willing to go out and fight this giant. And we know the rest of the story. He goes out with a slingshot. He kills the giant. The giant falls over dead. And he cuts off his head, presents it to King Saul. So what we find is David was willing to confront the enemy when no one else was. Now, here is some of the questions, and we've approached this in this way as we've been asking these questions, but ultimately, the, the, the big question is, what are we going to do when we have to confront the enemy? When we have to confront a giant in our own life, how are we going to do that? What are we going to deal with? Now, keep in mind, there's a lot of giants that can be in our life. We talked about all of these. We talked about the fact that there could be a you know, a giant in our life in regard to marital issues. There could be a giant in our life in regard to just sin issues, uh, Satan's attacks. There could be bitterness in our life. There could be some financial issues. There could be diseases. You name it, there's a lot of giants that we have to face in this world. And what are we going to do and how are we going to go about confronting that enemy? Amen. That's the question. So we pose this with several, we, we approach this with several different questions. And we first ask this question, what are you going to do when this situation just looks desperate? And in dealing with that, we delved into this question by realizing that, listen, there are a lot of situations in life that look so desperate that we know that we can't really win. And we have to resolve ourselves to realizing that the God that we serve is far bigger than any problem that the world can throw at us. And that while we can't confront it, the God that we serve can. And with a measure of faith, we need to approach that giant with all that God has given us. But the second question we asked was this, what do we do when all of those who we love and all of those who trust have failed 
have fallen by the wayside and leaves us standing all alone to confront the enemy. That's a tough battle because we count on our friends, we count on family, we want them with us. We want them to stand with us in times of battle. We want them to stand with us when we have to confront the giants. But what if there's no one there that will? We realize that when we know Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, when God is our part of our life, when we are filled with the Holy Spirit of God, we understand and we know that we are never alone because God is always with us. And we realize that God will stand with us even when no one else will. We also pose this question. Okay, then what do we do when those who we love, when those who are supposed to be standing with us begin to try to discourage us? You can't win. You can't do this. You can't accomplish that. You're going to lose. You can't do it. That's a tough one. At a time where we need encouragement the most, there are times when the people we love and care for the most fail. But we need to understand that, listen, there is always God who encourages us in his word, God who encourages us in his spirit, bearing witness with our spirit. There is always God who is the encourager. And if I am standing where God would have me to stand, doing as God would have me to do, serving as God would have me to serve, then the encouragement that he gives me in all of that should help me to stand against any foe. Amen. Last week, we posed this question. What will we do when we can't even get support from the leadership. Oh, that's tough. You mean when my pastor won't even stand with me? When, when the people that I love and care for, those that are, that are uh, designated to, to lead me and to guide me, when they will not lead me and guide me, what do I do? We find out that even when you can't find the good counsel from your leaders, even when you can't find leaders that'll stand with you in the day that you stand against your giants, we realize that again, that God will always stand with you. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He means the Lord is my shepherd, and as long as he is my shepherd, I have want for nothing else. God will always be there, will always guide me, will always lead me, will always encourage me. And in my deepest, darkest moments, God says, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. So when the giants are at the biggest, when the giants seem like they're un unable to be defeated, God says, I'll be with you. Well, let's pose another question today. Because I think this is an interesting question, and I find it to be so true, and it's this. What are we going to do when all of those people who have already quit, and by the way, this is what David faced. His brothers were a part of that Israeli army, and they had quit, and they were already discouraging him. David, you're just being wicked. You're just trying to stir up a problem. When Saul, who was supposed to be leading him, Saul had already quit, and Saul's back there going, you're just a young boy. You can't do this. And all he got was discouragement. What are we going to do when those who have already quit now try to tell us how to get the job done? When those who have already quit now decide to tell us, here's how you do it. Have you ever been in that situation? Have you ever been in a situation where people who are defeated, people who have already quit, people who want nothing to do with the battle, people who want nothing to do with facing the giants that you're having to face, and they sit back, but let me tell you how you need to do it. Let me tell you what has to be done. It is amazing to me at the number of people that know how to do the job that have never done the job. You find that true at work? You ever have that happen at work? Somebody that comes along and says, you're not doing that right. Well, how am I supposed to do it? Well, no, I've never done it, but you're not doing it right. <laughs> well, you know what? I want somebody to show me that has done it before. I want somebody to stand with me who has, has accomplished this. And what we find is all too often the people that want to tell us all the secrets are the people that have never won that battle. It would be, it'd be like me giving you advice on how to diet. You're looking at me and going, look, dude, if you knew how to diet, you'd be a little slender, skinny guy. Don't tell me how to diet. You know, it'd be like me trying to tell you how to do something that I've never done before. Let me tell you how to build a house. Man, I, I, got, a new, I got news for you. The most I've ever done is put a porch on, and I'm not so, so 
satisfied that I've done all that great a job with that. And so, you know, we need to understand that, listen, if we're going to give advice, we need to be people who have been in the battle, who have fought in the battle, who are strong in the battle. And if we're in the battle, we need to make sure that the people we're looking to for that encouragement are the people that are in the battle. I want to look at this. He says this, 1 Samuel chapter 17. Let's pick up in verse 38. He goes before Saul. Saul first tells him, you're too young, you can't do this. And finally he convinces Saul, listen, I'm going to go fight this guy no matter what. So Saul says, well, as long as you're going to fight him, I'll tell you what, let me give you something to fight him with. Now Saul's not willing to go out there. Saul's afraid of Goliath. Saul's not willing to be out there and, and battle him. But he's going to tell David how it's done. And so he says in verse 38, and Saul armed David with his armor. Put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor and he is saved to go. So, so Saul says, here's what I want you to do. You're going to go out there and fight, fight Goliath. Here's what we're going to do. Let me put my armor on you. So he puts his helmet on him, puts his armor on him, gives him his sword. And David's standing there with all of that and, and ready to go into battle. And he's ready to go face Goliath with all of these things that Saul had given him to go fight with. And look at what David does. He says, for he had not proved it. That is, I've never worn this stuff before. I've never put on a helmet like this. I've never put on a coat of mail like this. I've never wielded a sword. I've never went into battle with these kinds of things. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. He said, I can't go into battle with this stuff. I've never used this kind of thing before. Man, I faced a lion, I faced a bear, and I did it with a slingshot. In one case, you know, I just grabbed up the bear by his beard and, and, and killed him. I've never done this like this before. And he went into battle with Goliath with a weapon he was familiar with, but not with the weapons that Saul had given him. And so he put those things off. So here is Saul, who is not willing to face Goliath, even with all that armor on. He says, David, put the armor on and go face Goliath. And for just a, just a hot minute, David's ready to go face Goliath with all this armor on. He says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've never proved these things. I don't know how to go into battle with these things. I need to put these aside and I need, I need to face Goliath with the tools that I know work. So he went into battle the way he knew he needed to go into battle. Now, if I'm in a battle, I'm going to be real honest with you. I want, this is kind of what I want. I want people to go with me. I want people to stand with me. I want to be able to go with the encouragement of people I love and care for. I want to go knowing that the people I love and care for are behind me. I want to go into battle with, with people that are strong and people that, that want to do battle and are willing to trust God in this battle. I'm here to tell you something. You know, when we look at this whole situation, I, I don't particularly want to go into battle with just a big fan base cheering me on. Go get them, David! I want to go into battle with God. I want to go into battle with someone who has fought the battle and won. I want to go into battle with people who have been there before. I want people to encourage me. I want people to stand with me. I want people to go with me. I mean, we're in this battle and we don't want to be alone. We've talked about that. We don't want to be discouraged. We want people to encourage us and lift us up. But here is the deal. I want to go into this battle with all the tools that I know are effective and with the counsel that I know is effective. You know, um, it's interesting. But when we pastors get together, a lot of times we talk. We have a pastor's conference once a month. We go and hear some preaching and that kind of thing. And then afterwards, we kind of sit around tables and we just chat about different things. And as a pastor, we talk about sometimes just the way we do ministry, sometimes the way we do stuff. And one of the things that we were talking about just this last pastor's conference uh, with the guys that I was sitting with, where they were talking about the fact that, you know, what do you do when somebody goes into surgery? You know, if you have somebody in your church who goes into surgery, how do you handle that? 
And some of them said, well, what I usually do is I just have prayer with them on the phone at some point in time, and then, you know, they go have their surgery, and I'll check in on them later. And, um, and, and I said, well, what I like to do, I said, and I try very hard to do this, is I like to go and, and, and have prayer with them at the hospital before they go into surgery. I, I like to do that. I, I think it's an encouragement to them. And they said, well, why would you do that? I mean, what is the point? What difference does it make where you pray? What difference does it make how you encourage them as long as it gets done? And I'm like this. I said, you know, I don't know about you, but if I'm going into battle to face a giant, and I want somebody with me. I want somebody that's going to be right there physically to say that I'm by your side. I want somebody physically to say I'm praying for you. I want somebody physically to stand there with me and to encourage me. And, and I want to hear them pray and I want to hear them say those things. I want them physically right there with me. Because I don't like fighting battles alone. And I don't like fighting battles without what I believe to be all the tools that I need. And when I say tools today, keep in mind, some of the tools that we have today to fight battles with are the prayers of the saints. I think that's a, a primary tool. And I appreciate the fact that people say, Barry, I'm going to pray for you. I like that. I appreciate it when people say, Barry, don't worry about it. I'm praying. I'm going to pray. Your surgery is at 7 o'clock. I'm going to pray at 7 o'clock. I appreciate that. But let me tell you something. It's not that I don't trust you, but when you're right there by my side and I hear you praying, there is something different about it. Yeah. Because I know I'm not in that battle by myself. I know that there's somebody there with me. I know somebody is there ready to stand up against the giant with me. And I'm encouraged and I can face it with what I believe to be better counsel, better understanding better strength. This is where David is. He really needed those folks to be with him. He needed them to stand with him. Um, those who tremble in fear, such as Saul and all those guys that were sitting there in the trenches, um, all of them, I mean, what do they know about my battle? I mean, they're, they're afraid. They're already fearful. If I'm dying, I don't want to go to somebody that's afraid of dying. If I'm having to face a surgery, I don't want to go to find somebody that's afraid of facing surgery. I don't want to find somebody that whatever my giant is, that they're afraid of facing those things. It's not what I want. It's not what I want. I want somebody that's not fearful. That's not fearful. Somebody that says our God's a big God. I need to hear that. I need somebody to say, listen, you're facing this giant, not by yourself, but with a God that can conquer any giant. I want to hear that. I want to see that. I want that kind of counsel. I don't want the kind of counsel that is brought on by folks who are fearful. I want to mention to you, by the way, two types of fear. There is that fear of just being afraid. I'm going to be conquered. I'm going to be beaten down. There is a fear of the dark. There's a fear of all those things that just scare us. But there is also this fear that we ought to have in regard to God. And it's an awestruck fear. I know who God is. I know what God can do. I know how great and mighty he is. I know how righteous he is. I know how holy he is. I know of God's glory. I know how wonderful God is. And I fear him in the sense that I have such awe for who he is and what he can do. He tells us this. Uh, in, in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25 says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Amen. Now here's David and, Goli or David and Saul. And, and Saul is going, put your trust in my armor. Put your trust in my sword. Put your trust in my helmet. Put your trust in me in providing these things for you. And David, for just a minute was ready to go face Goliath, and he said, no, wait, wait, no, no. I'm going to put my trust in the Lord. I'm going to trust him. And he put all of that behind him and faced Goliath. Understand and know that sometimes, if we're not careful, if we put our faith in folks who fear man instead of fearing God, he says it's a snare. It's a snare. Anything that Saul had to say to him would be a snare because Saul was afraid of Goliath. Anything David's brothers might have said would be a snare because they're afraid of 
Goliath. He says, oh no, no, that's a snare. Proverbs says that's a snare. But whosoever putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. That's where I want my trust to be. I want my trust to be in the very God that can accomplish what God says that he can accomplish. David understood this. And while others feared Goliath, David feared God. David had no fear of Goliath because regardless of how big he was, strong he was, intimidating he was, he was just a man. I am never going to fear what God created so much as I fear the God of creation. And understand and know that he holds the key. He understands. He is the strong one. I love what David pens as well uh, in this 27th Psalm. In Psalm 27, he says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? He's saying, listen, God is in my life. Who can I fear? I can't fear whatever troubles come my way. I mean, come on, what, what difference does all of those things make? But you don't understand, how can we get through this life if we're financially destitute? I think there are folks who are financially destitute who know the Lord, deal with that every day of their life, but they just trust the Lord. But how, how am I going to be that if I've got all this disease, all this problem, what can I do? You can use that to minister to the Lord in some way, form, or fashion. I've shared this before. I believe without a shadow of a doubt, Brother Kelvin and I have talked about this, but a friend of mine, Brother Bill Raines, pastors Mission Baptist Church down in, um, I guess that's Kenwood. And, and his son, who we prayed for often, his son, Tim, has, uh, I don't know what the word is. He, he, he is, he's not able to function, all right? He has, he has some brain control and, and he's alive, but he can't, function. He just, it's all he is. And uh, it's been this way now for, I guess it's going on, what, three years? Is it longer than that maybe? Um, five years? It's been that long. My goodness. But it's for a great length of time. Every day someone stays there with him and cares for him and provides for him. And, and I think about this because here's the deal. I think about that disease and I think how terrible that is. And we could be discouraged by it and beaten down by it. And, but they go there to the nursing home and they minister to him. And they go, when he's in the hospital, they minister to him there. And here's what I know. Brother Bill has led quite a few folks to the Lord as a result of Brother Tim's illness. Now, they could be defeated. They could go there all defeated. They could go and visit him and they could be all dejected and they could be, oh, this is miserable. This is awful. The worst thing imaginable. I can't imagine anything any worse. You could do that. Or you could say, I have an opportunity to tell his nurses about Jesus Christ. I have an opportunity to tell the people visiting the other people about Jesus Christ. I have an opportunity in all of this. And what we find is they overcome the giant by their surrender to the Lord. Folks, we need to understand that I, I can't explain why things take place. I don't know why we have to face the giants. I don't know why the giants come in our life. But here's what I know if we face them with God, Amen. God will give us the victory in every one of them. Every single one of them. Those who tremble in fear have no idea how big our God is. Those who fear have no concept of how big God really is because if they did, they would not fear the giants that are in their life. This morning, I, it's kind of funny, it's happened to me, but I woke up this morning and, and I do all my normal morning stuff and some point in time, I usually just check my bank account, see if there's anything I need to address or anything I need to do with it. This morning, I, I pull up a bank account and it was all zeros. I'm like, oh, this is not good. This is really not good. And I thought, well, maybe we were hacked, you know? And uh, I took it into Debbie. I said, Debbie, have you checked our bank accounts this morning? No, why? Because it's all zeros. <laughs> no. Look. <laughs> she said, well, what happened? I said, I have no idea, but we have zero money. Zero money. And so we're sitting there watching, looking at it for a minute, and I'm kind of looking around. It has this little alert box that comes up. The little alert box says that they're reconfiguring or doing something and bear with them and they'll adjust it and everything will be fine later. Well, for just a moment, I'll be honest, 
thinking I had zero dollars, was a little fearful. It was a little scary. By the time I got to church, I checked it again, and my money's in there. <laughs> but for a moment, I got to tell you, I, I was a little bit fearful. Hey, it didn't stop my day. It didn't change what I was doing. I didn't go back to bed and say, well, my day's over. My life's shot. We still have work to do. We still have things to do. And bigger than that bank account is my God that put the money in there in the first place. And we need to, we need to realize that. And we need to always understand that, listen, our fear of God should be much bigger than any fear we have of anything in this world. I can't fear death because God's given me eternal life. I can't fear disease because God's a great physician and he can heal me either in life or in death. Either way gets the job done. Amen. I can't fear financial issues because God, my father, owns it all. And one of these days, I'm going to be heir to all of those things that he possesses. I can't fear rejection because even if all of mankind rejects me, I have the fellowship of God with me. Whatever it is that man has to fear, and whatever giants come our way, know that our God is bigger. I love what, uh, what Paul tells Timothy in, in 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love, and I like this, and of a sound mind. You ever thought about how those three things go together? Power, love, sound mind. We have the power to do more than you would ever imagine. But we love people too much to do that. But thirdly, all of that is brought about because, quite frankly, we have a sound mind. We can think rationally. We have the ability to think things through and realize, my God's bigger than all that. My God is so big. And the sound mind tells me there is no reason to fear because the very God that brought all this into existence is my Father. He loves me and He cares for me. That's what a sound mind does. It gives you that ability to look at it in a reasonable fashion. God, I get it. I get it. You love me. You care for me. Man, the power that you have is overwhelming. But God, I'm smart enough to know as much as you love me, as much as you care for me, you would never, never let me fall. And I look at this picture and I think, man, how great is that? How great is that? Facing and conquering giants in our life gives us a greater realization of what God can do. I look back over my life. I've got to be real honest with you. This is where the sound of mind comes in. Sometimes we live for today. Something happens and we think the world fell apart. When we look back over our life, I've got to be real honest with you. There are a lot of times where there were giants and God overcame them. I thought about that this morning when opened my bank account, there was zero in there. And I thought, you know what? There have been a lot of times in our life where we had zero and didn't know where the next dollar was coming from. We had some really tough times early on in our marriage. We had no idea where the next dollar was coming from. And you know what? God saw us through it every time. God took care of us, provided for us. Everything just worked out. I've had times where, you know, we dealt with disease in our family, and, and it was hard. It was difficult to deal with. Debbie's been through some things. We had a son that passed away, and, you know, first one thing or another, and i got to tell you, those are difficult days, and those were hard. I'm not going to pretend like they weren't easy days, but my God was bigger than all of those. And there was nothing that those giants could do to us that was bigger and better than what my God could do for us. Man, I look at that, and I think, man, how incredible is my God. So fa facing and conquering those giants in our life, even in the past, gives us the realization that, you know what, whatever I'm facing today is no different than what I faced yesterday, the day before, or whenever it might have been. Those who tremble in fear have no idea of the things that you and I know. Saul had no concept of what David knew. Saul all he could see was how big the giant was. Saul, all he could see was the only way to face this is the way we've always done it, throw on the armor, get the sword out, and do our best. What David saw 
was his God. He didn't see the armor. He didn't see Saul. He didn't see how big the giant was. All he saw was how great God was. That's what he saw. And so when I look at this, this, this in David's life, I realize that his faith and his trust in God caused him to be able to stand up against the giant that he couldn't possibly stand up against if it were not for God. We have to be able to see beyond the giant and see how great our God is. You know, I can sit in the stands and I can cheer for a ball player. You know, we do that all the time. We go down to a ball game, we sit there and, man, we watch them play. And we think, whoa, yeah, yeah, yeah. Our favorite ball player gets up there to bat, you know, and we can cheer him on. But here's the deal. I've never faced down a 101 mile per hour fastball. <laughs> I don't really know what it's like to face that giant. Who am I? What if I just jumped up out of the stands and went down this? Hey, listen, you're standing all wrong. You got to get your feet spread apart just a little more. Hunch down just a little. You're not holding the bat back far enough. And he's going to look at me like, what kind of an idiot are you? You've never faced this before. You'd be afraid to stand up here against a 101 mile an hour fa uh, fastball. And I'd be like, yes, sir, you're right. But I can tell you how to do it. I can go on social media and tell everybody how, how bad a hitter you are because you can't do it. But here's the deal. He knew how to hit a fastball. He was facing it in the way that he needed to face it. We need to understand the giants that we face in our life can only be faced by the God that we serve. And we need to understand that the confidence in him is not by our strength, but it's in his. Paul says that he was made minister, made a minister by Christ. And he was given the task of revealing all these mysteries of God. And, and to let them know in Ephesians 3.12, he says, In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. We have something that the world doesn't have. The world can't come in here and tell us how to do church. The world can't tell you how to live a Christian life. The world can't tell you how to, how to deal with any of the giants in your life because they don't know the God that we know. Those who tremble in fear of the giants in their life can't possibly conquer them because they don't know what God can do. Folks, understand and know, my battles can't be fought with fear, but with courage. They can't be fought with advice from those who have already been defeated but rather by the counsel of our undefeated God. My greatest counsel, my greatest strength, my greatest encouragement comes from the one who, is great, who has already defeated the enemy. You know, it's interesting. When we look at the life of Jesus Christ, here's what he knew. He knew the end. He knew the end of the story. He was willing to go through life with nowhere to lay his head by his own admission. He was willing to go through life ridiculed, people hating him, sending him to the cross, causing him to suffer and to be beaten. Yet he knew what had to be done in order for greatness to be accomplished, in order for you and I to have salvation, in order for you and I to be able to have eternal life. He knew what he must do. In order for our sins to be forgiven, Jesus Christ had to die on the cross to pay the penalty of our sins. And he did so without any support, without any help from anybody else, he did so because he knew what could be accomplished in it. Folks, we need to understand we're going to face some giants in our life. And there comes a time when you have to just put aside all those things that the world tells you you have to do. Put aside some of those things that even loving, well-meaning people tell you you need to do. And realize that when I face that giant... I need to do so trusting God and what God can do in my life. Bow your heads with me for just a moment. I mean, I don't know your life today. I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know what giants you might be facing. I don't know. But here's what I do know. We serve a God that's bigger than any of them. And while we might be in a position where we feel like, you know what, everybody's always trying to tell me what to do and how to do it. Listen, there's time that we know God's word, we spend our time in prayer, and we spend our time in our relationship with God, and we say, God, I need you to lead and guide me. I need to make the decisions you want me to make. Dear God, I want to face these giants with you. Today, whatever it might be that you're dealing with, trust that God can give you the strength and the courage to do so without fear, 
without bitterness, without anger, without frustration, but to be able to face them in just the way God would have you to. Dear Father, I pray today we're not to be answering to the world. I'm not going to answer to false prophets, to false preachers, false teachers, false leaders. I am not going to be answering to anyone but you. And so, dear God, I want to come to you today. And dear God, you give us the leadership, give us the courage, give us the strength to face whatever it is we need to face in this world. Lord God, I love you. And realize that our faith in you is what causes us to draw close to you, to have that fellowship that we so desire. Lord God, we love you. We care for you. We ask, Lord, that you work and move in our lives today. If there are decisions that need to be made, whatever those decisions might be, Lord God, I pray that today they'll surrender to you before it's eternally too late. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.